What's up audit fans, Dr. Amanda White here with another video in my Standards Explained series. And today we're going to be looking at ASA ISA 600, which is about what we need to do when we audit a group financial report. Now, of course, ASA 600 is equivalent to ISA 600. So if you're studying the international standards, this video is also helpful for you. As always, our standards are prepared by the Auditing and Assurance Standards Board here in Australia. Here's our table of contents. And if you zoom in, you'll notice that there's quite a lot going on in this particular standard. Pretty usual stuff, objectives and definitions and requirements. You'll notice there's quite a lot of requirements here because there's some very specific information to follow. And then there is probably more in the explanatory material. As usual, I don't go through the explanatory material, but I'll give you the link for you to download the standard and have a look yourself. As always, our Australian standards are internationally harmonized with ISA 600. So if you are studying the international versions of the standard, this video should still be useful for you as well. Now let's get into the scope to start with. So the scope is really what is covered in this standard. So it says we're looking at group audits. Now later on, we'll define the idea of a group audit, but what is unique about ASA 600 is that we're looking at component auditors. And so what will happen is that you'll have the group auditor and then you'll also have component auditors. And there might be one or there could be multiple component auditors uh, doing different jobs in different geographical locations. Now the example they give here is something like an auditor might involve another auditor to observe inventory or fixed physical assets at a remote location. So there's geographical differences. Now if that same auditor is within the same firm, then we wouldn't normally call that another auditor. It'd just be an, an auditor hired by the same firm. Typically when we say another auditor, we mean a different audit firm. So when we look at audits of groups, an ASA 220 on quality control says the engagement partner has to be satisfied that those performing the group audit, including the component auditors, have the right levels of skill. So if you are the group partner, then you are responsible for making sure that component staff meet the requirements of ASA 220. Now ASA 220 says that you have to follow the relevant uh, government laws. So that means including that they meet independence requirements, that they meet ethical standards under um, our code of ethics, um, either APES 110 or the new code of ethics coming in. So what are the objectives of the standard? Uh, the objectives of the auditor are determine whether to act as the group auditor. And if acting as the group auditor, we have to talk with the component auditors and get sufficient appropriate evidence about what's happening within the components. So if you've got one group consolidation and you've got many components down here, component one, component two, component three, you need to make sure that the evidence they collect meets our requirements of being sufficient and appropriate, meets all of the other requirements in association with the standards. So let's look at some definitions and we've got all of these different definitions here. I'm sort of gonna move on to the next slide and I'm gonna take all these definitions and I'm gonna draw a little map. I'm gonna put the company in black and you've got the, the group, all right? So that's usually uh, the parent entity. Then under the group, you have all of the different components. All right, so component, let's go with a few A, component B, component C. Okay, so all of these components are consolidated to form the group. Now I'm going to do the auditor here in green. So we will have a group auditor and the group auditor has to audit the group. They have to produce an opinion for the entire group. 
Now, what you have also is that component A will have a component auditor. All right. As will, and you know, let's assume that these are all in different jurisdictions. They will also have a component auditor. These got people over here will have a component auditor. Okay, and so they're going to be auditing all of those, but each of these component auditors will produce a component opinion. All right, so these are all little opinions created by each of our component auditors based on the component company. Now the group auditor then takes all of these component opinions into play when they're auditing the group and creating their own opinion. Okay, so we've got the group, we've got the group auditor, we've got the components, we've got the component auditors. Now the group auditor is actually going to have its own engagement partner. All right, and that engagement partner is going to be responsible for this entire process down here, including the work done by the component. Um, and so therefore, they've got a really big responsibility. They need to make sure they're picking the right auditors and that when they evaluate the information, they're doing it appropriately. So what are the exact requirements? Well, as I mentioned before, that group partner has a lot of responsibility because they have to look after the direction, supervisation and performance of the group audit engagement. That also means that we have to consider what's happening in the components. Now, our audit report does not refer to a component auditor, but we do rely on their work in preparing our audit. All right, so there's some specific rules around acceptance and continuance. So if the audit does involve a group, the group partner has to say, well, can we get enough evidence from the consolidation process and the components to base the audit opinion? So there is the potential here for a scope limitation if we can't get audited uh, reports on all of the components. So back on our other diagram, if we missed a component, then there's the potential there for a scope limitation where we can't get sufficient and appropriate evidence on a component. What do I have to consider? If they think it's not possible to get sufficient appropriate evidence due to restrictions imposed by the group, the client themselves, then I'm gonna have the potential for a disclaimer of opinion from that scope limitation. So I either decide I'm not gonna accept the engagement or potentially to withdraw. And that's gonna be a problem for those managers, all right? They need to find an auditor. If they don't find an auditor, um, then they're going to have some issues with the regulator. So this is an unlikely situation right here. Uh, management are likely to give you access to be able to do that particular audit, um, but it's probably not a client that you would want to keep. Now you have to have a contract. So you have under ASA 210 an engagement letter. Like any audit, you have to have an audit plan uh, for the group audit. Um, and then they're also responsible um, for making sure that what's happening in the components is happening appropriately. So this is all of this stuff um, here in paragraph 17 is really a replication of the stuff we see in ASA 315, which says things like identify and assess risk of material and um, misstatement. Understand the group, like understand the client. But what's different is this bit here that says understand the consolidation process. So understand how all of the group components are consolidated together. Now I don't teach consolidations, but um, certainly there must be some stuff you can check out on YouTube about consolidations. But that's one of the things you have to understand. How is everything consolidated and is there any risk of misstatement? For example, 
If consolidation was a manual process, then there's the potential for increased risk of material misstatement. If it is a computerized process, then you need to make sure that you understand the internal controls around that computer process. So you have to set your strategy for the group, but you also have some uh, requirements in relating to the component auditors. So if we ask a component auditor to do some work, I have to understand following information. Will they comply with ethical requirements? Do they have the right skills? Will they be involved? Uh, so the group uh, has to decide whether they're going to be involved in a way so that we can make sure that there's sufficient appropriate evidence and that they operate in a regulatory environment that oversees auditors. So actively oversees auditors would be things like we're in a country where they have audit inspections and um, potentially North Korea, for example, might not have an active process to oversee auditors. But what happens if the component auditor fails on one of these? Well, if we fail on independence or we have other serious concerns, then we have to think, can we get sufficient appropriate evidence? If we can't get sufficient appropriate evidence, again, this brings up the possibility of a scope limitation. Now we've planned the audit, we've done our background, we also have to consider materiality. So the group engagement team decides materiality, but we also have to determine component materiality and we tell the component auditors what that is and we give them certain instructions. So they have to perform the audit um, and then the engagement team evaluates their work in relation to their materiality. So we've set our materiality, we've identified our risks. Once we've identified risks, ASA normally, this is ASA 330, ISA 330, says that we have to respond to those risks. That is, we have to design a strategy and those appropriate responses are ways to identify whether there are any potential material misstatements that arise from these particular risks. So what does it mean by determine appropriate responses to the potential for material misstatements? Well, it's really going to be about our audit programs, our audit strategy, how we're going to collect our evidence. Those are the main key things here. So nature, timing and extent of our audit evidence is one of those parts. Um, related to how much evidence, the strategy. So are we going to be testing internal controls or are we going to be doing substantive work? We also need to be considering when we gather that evidence as well. If a component is significant, it's individually significant to the group, I have to do that audit using the component materiality, follow all of our normal requirements here for um, identifying potential risk. Now, what happens if you have a component that's not significant, it's not material, it's not large, then we don't need a component auditor. So in that instance, no component auditor, because the auditing standard actually says to us, well, the group can just do analytical procedures at the group level. Now, they still have to make an evaluation is that sufficient appropriate evidence? But the minimum they have to do is this analytics. They might decide that there's some risk areas, so then we might do more on financial information and control processes um, based on our assessment of whether there's some potential misstatement. So what do we do about the work performed by the component auditors? Well, if they have to do a risk assessment, I need to be involved in that risk assessment process to say, are you doing it properly? Have you identified everything? The standard also says a minimum. So it's very clear it says that the group engagement team, so anyone on the team doesn't necessarily have to be the partner, but the team shall include on the next page, the minimum of talking with the component auditor or component management um, about business activities that are significant. So only significant business activities. 
We also need to consider with the auditor the potential for material misstatement. All right, where is their risk of their potential error within the financial statements or fraud? And then we're going to look at their documentation of how they identified significant risks. Remember, significant risks comes from ISA ASA 315 and says you have to identify those areas or accounts that are at greater risk of material misstatement. So you have to talk, all right? So there's three different parts here. Talk with uh, the auditor or management about business activities. Talk about the risk, and this is really the inherent risk in the account um, and any other significant risks. How do we decide what we should do in terms of communicating with our component auditor? So we shall communicate with them on a timely basis. So that's frequent, regular communication. We shall set out the work that's performed, tell them what to do. Um, and we also give them guides on how they should communicate with us, but includes things like um, confirming that the component auditor will cooperate with the group engagement team. You'd sign a contract with them. You reinforce the ethical components or the ethical requirements under APS 110 or the Code of Ethics. Uh, we talk about materiality. So essentially, these are all the things that the standard says we have to do prior, but here it's saying you actually have to communicate with these. Materiality, significant risks, related parties, subsequent events. Now, what do we ask the component auditor to talk to us about at the very end? Well, we ask the component auditor to communicate um, with us, the group auditor, about things like, did they meet the ethical requirements? Have they followed the team's requirements that they gave above? Any issues of non-compliance with laws? What information they looked at? This one's really key, the list of uncorrected misstatements in the financial report. So if the component auditor found errors, and then component management said, okay, yep, I agree, I'm gonna make those changes, then we potentially have an unqualified opinion and true and fair um, material in the component. However, if management said, I'm going to refuse, I'm not going to include or make the changes that you find, then we've got misstatements. Now, we need to figure out whether they are material, okay, um, and communicate those up the chain of command to the group auditor, and they will determine what impact that has on the reporting at the group level. So typically, component materiality should be important at the group level, um, but it's best for the group engagement auditor to make that decision. The group audit team also has to make sure that the evidence they got from the component auditor is sufficient and appropriate. So talk to them about, did anything happen? Um, did we find any issues? Did you run into any troubles? What other documentation that you have? So that documentation really should be shared. Um, and with electronic file sharing now, that shouldn't be any, uh, shouldn't be difficult at all. So they have to decide, is it sufficient and appropriate? to reduce risk to an acceptably low level. Now that's nothing new there in that particular standard. ASA 500 and all the other evidence standards say something fairly similar. Remember back up top where we talked about the potential of uncorrected misstatements, errors that management won't change? Well, we have to identify whether there are any of those or any scope limitations because we couldn't collect um, appropriate evidence because that might impact on the eventual opinion that we end up giving for the group. Now, I've done the audit. So we've had the audit, all right? We've chatted with the component audit team, check. We've gone away and we've drafted our audit opinion for the group, check. Then the last thing that we have to do is we have to talk to the people who are involved in corporate governance. So your audit committee and your board, 
Again, this is nothing really different here. We just have to tell them what we found. Are there any com problems in components? Are there any um, uncorrected misstatements? Did you run into any trouble gathering data um, or talking to people? Um, if there was any fraud, oops. If there was any fraud, we need to bring that to the attention of the, those charged with governance. That's really not any different to ASA ISA 240. So this is really reinforcing all of the communication protocols that we have to do with individual clients in the group setting. And very finally, last but not least, documentation. Again, all of this documentation stuff fits in with ASA 220 on quality control, fits in with ASA 500 on audit evidence and documenting audit evidence. Now I also wanted to include, I don't normally do explanatory material, but there's this great little flowchart at the back of the appendices that maps out sort of what you should do. So step one, is the component individually significant? No. Is it likely to contain any misstatements? If it's low risk, then we can just do analytics. Um, if it is significant, we have to do an audit of the component work. If it's uh, not significant, but may contain risk of misstatement, we again have to do some more audit work. Then all that feeds into the group audit and communication with the component auditors. So with our analytical procedures, or with doing our more comprehensive audit, we say, have we got sufficient and appropriate evidence? If not, we have to do more detailed audits of those component informations. If it's yes, we've got sufficient appropriate evidence, then we're good to just talk with the component auditors about our findings and their findings. Whew, that was a mammoth auditing standard. Um, it's got quite a lot of complexity in there, so thank you for sticking with me on the video for this one. If you thought it was useful or if you have any other questions on components and groups, please pop them in the comments. Of course, I'd love it if you'd subscribe. If you've got any other suggestions for videos, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you next time. Bye.